Okay, the last topic I want to discuss here is enzyme regulation. So this is pretty much the last thing you really need to worry about for enzymes, at least for an introductory course. I mean, the textbook will go into great detail, but um, I think this is pretty detailed, and it's good to just understand, you know, conceptually what's going on. So this is titled Enzyme Regulation, and enzymes control which reactions take place within a cell. So the cell must regulate enzyme activity. So the enzymes control what reactions are, can occur because enzymes act as catalysts to speed up reactions by lowering activation energy. Um, if you watched the previous videos, you already know that. So there are four primary means of regulation. The first one is called proteolytic cleavage. So many enzymes are released into their environment in an inactive form called a zy zymogen or proenzyme. I like proenzyme because it's a little easier to pronounce. Um, when specific peptide bonds on zymogens are cleaved, the zymogens become irreversibly activated. So, so the, the key here is that you have this proenzyme here, okay? It's released into the environment in an inactive form. We can see right here it says it's inactive, so it's not active. And then what ends up happening here is the zymogens are cleaved and it becomes or rather a specific peptide on this. I mean, in this case, it's very general. I'm not talking about any specific enzyme in particular, but um, anyway, the zymogen is cleaved, and a peptide on the zymogen is cleaved, and it becomes irreversibly activated. So it becomes activated, it starts catalyzing the reaction it's meant to catalyze, um, you know, without any sort of regulation. So activation of zymogens can, may be instigated by other enzymes so it may so basically what that's saying is that other enzymes other enzymes can actually in, sort of induce this activation of these proenzymes induce the activation of the proenzymes so they're not active another enzyme comes along activates it and um, allows it to uh, start you know working its magic and doing and doing the proper reactions so activation of zymogens and and also by changes in the environment. I mean, that's obvious. Anytime you change the environmental conditions, that's like the temperature, the pH, um, you, you're going to change the activity of an enzyme. And um, so, for example, here, I actually have a little example here. Pepsigen, pepsinogen, uh, is a zymogen activated by low pH. So there you go. That's a change in conditions right there. So pepsinogen, it's, it's initially released in an inactive form. Once the pH gets low enough, it's active. It's irreversibly activated, so it's activated by low pH. The second type of um, regulation is reversible covalent modification. Now, you know this, this is pretty common too. So some enzymes are activated or deactivated by phosphorylation. Actually, phosphorylation is very common. If you've ever studied the metabolic pathways at all, if you've studied, you know, glycolysis, gluconeogenesis. Um, citric acid cycle, oxidative phosphorylation, or um, electron transport chain, uh, and then end oxidative phosphorylation, then you know that you know phosphorylation is common. Phosphorylating um, different different um, things that you want to activate, so different enzymes you want to activate or deactivate. That's what phosphorylation is very good at. So. So some enzymes are activated or deactivated by phosphorylation or the addition of some other modifier like AMP. That's adenosine monophosphate. The removal of the modifier is always is almost always accomplished by hydrolysis. Well, that's common too. Remember, hydrolysis is one of the main reactions that's going to happen in any biological system. So always think about hydrolysis. Phosphorylation occurs in the presence of protein kinase A. So that's that's also very common. You'll see protein kinase A activating things like um, triacylglycerol lipase. Um, that's an enzyme that's involved in beta oxidation. So triacylglycerol lipase um, will be activated in the presence of um, protein kinase A. So that's a, it's activated actually in a similar, very similar way to uh, the, to the effects of, of uh, glucagon. So. I just thought I'd add that. Um, control proteins, so there's control proteins, are protein subunits that associate with certain enzymes um, to activate or inhibit their activity. Uh, G proteins is a typical example of um, control proteins. And, and probably one of the most common ones that I've already talked about in videos and then I'm going to talk about here is allosteric interactions. So,
Allosteric regulation is the modification of an enzyme's configuration resulting from the binding of an activator or inhibitor at a specific binding site on the enzyme. So it's usually a site other than the active site. The enzyme bind the um, allosteric regulator binds at that location and causes some sort of change, usually conformational change in the enzyme, that um, allows it to um, either be activated or inactivated depending on the type of um, effect. So a classic example of some allosteric um, interactions might be like hexakinase. Um, hexakinase is the, is the first enzyme that catalyzes the phosphorylation of glucose. So if you see hexakinase, you might, um, you'll see that it's, um, it's activated by, by things like glucose and it also has negative feedback inhibition or feedback inhibition resulting from the glucose 6 phosphate which actually inhibits hexakinase so you know other allosterics can be um, or common allosterics could be like ATP ATP generally uh, for things like glycolysis deactivates it so those are some other things we'll talk more about that stuff in a future video so normally normally the enzyme governs just one reaction in a series of reactions so one enzyme governs only one particular reaction um, if one of the products downstream in the reaction comes back and inhibits the enzyme activity of an earlier stage, this phenomenon is called, is called negative feedback or feedback inhibition. So basically what happens in feedback inhibition is you have some, if I can get my marker to work here, enzyme plus some substrate, okay, and it forms the enzyme substrate complex and then this goes over to enzyme plus product now what happens here is once we have this so there's some enzyme that, that catalyzes this part here so you know this will come back so whatever this enzyme here is I'm just gonna put a 1 and a 2 what would happen is this product would come back and inhibit this enzyme that started the first the reaction to begin with so that's sort of what we're talking about here um, and as I said before hexakinase is a great example that most people are aware of and basically what happens with hexakinase is it phosphorylates glucose makes glucose 6-phosphate now as the glucose 6-phosphate increases the concentration increases to a certain level it starts sending a signal back to the back to hexakinase that hey things are going a little too fast here we have too much glucose 6-phosphate let's dial this back a little bit so it actually inhibits um, hexakinase from continuing its process of phosphorylating glucose. That's the way it, that's the way it goes about um, regulating that, that particular reaction. So negative feedback provides a shutdown mechanism for a series of enzymatic reactions when the series has produced a sufficient amount of product. So that's exactly what I just described. Uh, most enzymes work within some type of negative feedback cycle. That's common. Negative feedback, this sort of feedback inhibition is common in all areas. It's common in neurobiology and it's certainly common in biochemistry. So positive feedback also occurs and that's when the product returns to activate the enzyme. So positive feedback mechanisms occur less often though. So yeah, you're, you're definitely not going to encounter positive feedback as much as negative feedback and feedback in, in, inhibitors do not resemble the substrate so just remember that it doesn't resemble the substrate of the enzyme they inhibit instead in the, they, 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 blah, blah. <laughs> excuse me instead they bind to the enzyme and change the reaction so this is called allosteric regulation so that's, that's exactly what allosteric regulation is they don't bind at the active site they don't mimic the substrate at all they bind at a completely different site and they usually induce a conformational change in the enzyme that either activates it or deactivates it. Okay. Um, all allosteric inhibitors are not necessarily non-competitive inhibitors because many alter KM without affecting Vmax. So remember one of the things we said, non-competitive inhibition, they're going to have the different KMs, so they're going to have a higher KM, but have the same Vmax. Okay. Um, at low substrate concentration, small increases in substrate concentration increase enzyme efficiency as well as reaction rate. The first substrate changes the shape of the enzyme, allowing the other substrates to bind more easily. This is known as cooperative binding. So that's exactly what I described in the videos on hemoglobin was that once oxygen bound, it was very difficult, or at least not very difficult, but more difficult to get the oxygen to bind initially. But once that oxygen is bound, once it once it's bound to one 
of the subunits of uh, hemoglobin, it induces a conformational change in that subunit, which you know, which also then because they're so tight to each other, so closely spaced, that induces a conformational change that makes it easier for the next oxygen to bind to the next subunit, and that goes on and on, getting easier and easier until by the time you get to the fourth um, enzyme, uh, by the time you get to the fourth oxygen binding to um, to hemoglobin, it's it's simple and there's nothing to it.